everyone. My name is Simon Hamlin, and I'm the director of sales here at Study in the USA. Thank you so much for joining us today. I will be moderating today's session alongside our three wonderful guests, Georgina Antelon, the director of student testing at the University of Texas at El Paso, Aaron Bixler, the senior associate director of international enrollment at Miami University, and Darren Grosh, the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs at Los Angeles City College. As always, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Please drop into the chat where you're joining us from and why you decided to attend today's session. We'll be leveraging this information to help make sure we make this session valuable for you. Now, one of the biggest challenges institutions have faced over the past few years is the need to evolve their strategies and tactics to help boost international admissions, especially since so much has changed in the past few years. Today, we are here to take a deep dive into the tools our panelists use to boost international student recruitment and admissions. There's nothing like hearing directly from your peers for insights and guidance. We'll have a lot of fun along the way too, as they will be sharing specific examples so that you can walk away with actionable tips. Luckily, our three guests have a lot of industry experience and have continued to explore and implement new international admissions processes over the past few years. They're here to share examples like how they've worked to optimize the digital presence of their institution, how they've created a more personalized and supportive student experience and much more. Additionally, they will also be discussing common admissions practices to help them hit their recruitment goals, like accepting both the TOEFL IBT and the TOEFL Essentials tests to demonstrate English language proficiency. But before we dive in, I wanna mention that we will be having a Q&A at the end of the session. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and our guests or one of our study in the USA or TOEFL moderators We'll answer them in the chat shortly. All right, let's go ahead and get started. We've got three great guests. Each one of you, could you go ahead and introduce yourself with your name, your school, and your role in international education? Darren, let's go ahead and start with you. All right. Well, hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you again for the introduction. I want to apologize for my background, my computer. <clears throat> Decided to not work this morning, so I'm, I rushed to get a Mac, which is what I'm using right now, and it is the slowest Mac ever. So I want to apologize, and I'll be working to get that background up. We're just we're happy to have you here because yeah, this, no, I, I this is background. Last time we saw you when we talked on on uh, on on Zoom, uh, Darren was was driving with sunglasses in 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 LA. So this is we we're, we're glad you're safe, and I'll, I'll let you continue. I, I appreciate it. So again, uh, again, thanks for the introduction. My name is Darren Grosh. I'm the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs at Los Angeles City College, and I'm just really excited to, uh, to be here. Thank you, Darren. All right, Georgina. Hi, good morning. My name is Georgina Antillon, and I'm the Director of Student Testing at the University of Texas at El Paso. And my role is to provide students with all the possible opportunities that they have to be admitted into our university. And of course, my sole purpose is to push testing. <laughs> yes. And finally, Aaron. Hi everyone, my name is Aaron Bixler. I'm the Senior Associate Director for International, International Enrollment at Miami University in Ohio. And my role is really oversee, helping to oversee uh, international undergraduate student admission, recruitment, placement, um, kind of up to, up to enrollment. Fabulous. Aaron, why don't we stick with you for this, this first question? Uh, why were you interested in participating in this session and, and what are you hoping people can take away from this session? Well, I was interested in participating kind of, you know, for certainly for some selfish reasons. I'm always looking for new ideas in terms of recruitment, enrollment, learn a little bit more about what other folks may be doing, um, what's working, what's not working. And if I can share a little bit of, of my experience with what I found that's been working or not working recently, then I think that would be hopefully be helpful to somebody, somebody out there. Thank you. Darren, how about you? You know, for me, one, I just love hearing what my other colleagues are doing at other campuses and seeing the creative ways that they're trying to navigate to boost enrollment, to boost engagement. 
And I think, you know, for me, I hope it's just some takeaways that people are able to get from this is that there's a lot of creative ways that you can think about how you want to boost enrollment or how you want to go ahead and create engagement, whether you have a really large budget and a, and a pretty robust staff, or if you're operating kind of on a shoestring budget, uh, a lot of maybe armchair recruitment and you're, you're the director that's also the admissions person, the marketing person, uh, the programming person, which I think a lot of us sometimes do wear a lot of those hats. So I hope that's something that uh, we can talk about and share and people can kind of take away some really great ideas on how they can maybe implement some of these thoughts on campus. Georgina, why were you interested in participating in this session and what are you hoping people take away from it? Well, I hope that um, as institutions, we are pushing our boundaries and trying to recruit more international students so we can make our student population more diverse and to be able to be share those experiences and how we can improve uh, and bounce off ideas off of each other. Well, you, you all seem very supportive and uh, easy to to work with. I mean, we we've, we've talked before on on numerous occasions so everyone is in good hands and and so you know we're all we're all here because we do share a common goal we're looking to attract international students and optimize the admissions process so let's talk openly about the challenges what do you find most challenging and what steps have you taken to overcome those challenges uh, aaron let's go ahead and start with you on that Sure. So um, very, very timely topic. We we're just looking at kind of application, undergraduate application numbers from international students for, for January, for spring and for, for fall, for August um, today and kind of asked some questions about projecting enrollment based on those, those application numbers. And the numbers, the raw numbers of applicants have really, for us, recovered from, from the past few years and they're, we're way ahead of last year applicant wise. But it's a different looking applicant pool. And the challenge is, you know, how does this different looking group of students and we normally see apply or enroll, um, how are they going to complete the application process? How are they going to, uh, what are, how are they going to decide whether or not to, to come to our university? What are the challenges this group may face that other previous group of applicants haven't? And how do we address those? So kind of steps we've taken, I guess, is really to be, as accessible as possible to the students and their families, um, to be as transparent as possible too um, with the application process, the financial aid process, um, being available through one-on-one -on -one calls, you know, being available through you know, WhatsApp or, or other channels to, to get answers to these the students' questions. So really keeping the lines of communication open and, and accessibility, which is I know hugely yeah. important. Thank you. Georgina, how about for you? What, what kinds of challenges are you seeing and what steps are you taking to try to overcome those challenges? Well, for us, definitely once the pandemic hit, we were like, oh my God, we need options to get these students tested and to still be admitted. You know, so luckily partnering up with ETS and um, having essentials was definitely another option that the students were able to um, have right because now not only is this test so accessible and they're able to take it at home and it's really short it's not as long as the other tests which is a great plus and so it was really good to see that the testing companies were out there in making these changes happen because a lot of the us in the testing industry, we we're, were so used to paper pencil, you know, and so a lot of testing companies had to really switch over to do online testing. So it definitely has worked out for us in that sense and being able to be um, um, a university that would accept these tests, you know, and to be able to do the research and to be able to implement their scores to be um, part of the admission process. So it was really um, hard, a hard time, but now we're like in a smooth transition and being able to provide these services to the students. Yeah. And Darren, smooth sailing at LACC, right? No, no challenges, everything's just, uh, just peachy keen. And I think- Just you're like my background situation, uh, flexibility is the key, uh, <laughs> right. and adaptability. You know, <laughs> there I mean, you go. 
when things just seem like it's going to go right and smooth and then all of a sudden you realize that it, it's not going right and everything could just possibly go wrong that can go wrong yeah uh you have to figure out how to make moves and how to adjust and how to meet the needs of of your students uh, like georgina mentioned having the ability of a test like TOEFL and TOEFL Essentials, making it easy for students to go ahead and, and, and test is a key component because that's a big part of our admission process. So if people can't take the proficiency test then they're not going to be able to go ahead and, and join our school. And so you need companies like TOEFL to figure out ways to go ahead and create an accessible test for students. For us, and I, I think Aaron really nailed it, you know, it's communication and opening new ways of communicating you know previously before at LACC it was a paper application was mailed to your institution and you had to have all these documents you'd open it up in the mail and, and that's how this would be sent out right but now we have a zoom room we can have communication with our students like this we're able to go ahead and um, use really great applications like unibuddy to have another way of communicating with our students um, we have an online application now, which it's crazy to think that we didn't even have that before COVID, right? That it was just a paper-based application. And so to make those adjustments and to meet the needs of our students has been really critical and to really think on the fly. And I think COVID has allowed us to really kind of think outside the box and how we, we work with our students. Yeah, well, and even with all these amazing new advancements and, and changes, you know, as we all know, not everything we do is going to work, especially when we're trying these new things. So, uh, Georgina, can you talk about something you've tried to implement that didn't work out well? And, and in the process, what did you learn and what tips do you have for all of us? Well, I think it was uh, very important to um, to get everybody's buy-in, right? <laughs> so making sure that uh, one of the challenges uh, was that once we decided, okay, uh, Essentials is going to be part of our uh, repertoire of tests that we will allow for admission process, um, graduate school being separate from undergraduate, um, it was really hard to be able to get the buy-in, right? And so how was I able to get the buy-in from them was definitely letting them know that this test included a video portion of it. And with that video portion of it, letting them know that they will be able to separate these students from being able to provide more information about themselves and to be able to put their best foot forward and then being able to see them, understand them where they're coming from and perhaps even allowing them with this little snippet, being able to provide them with a TA ship, a teacher assistantship or a graduate assistantship to be able uh, to continue with their education because we know that a lot of these students, they count on, on this uh, specific um, money to be able to come to our institutions. So it's important that we see that to, to see the options that the students have. And we will come back to that video component uh, a little later in this discussion. Thank you for bringing that up. Aaron, can you talk about something you've tried to implement and that didn't go so well and what what did you learn from that and any tips you want to share sure um so prior to the the pandemic i would say about 25 percent of our new international first year students were actually u.s high school graduates and so we thought you know what a what a great and and an easier way to recruit international students than to just go to u.s high schools where these students are and we put a lot of emphasis in recruiting these international students that are already in the U.S. or maybe they're at, at ESL programs or U.S. high schools or, or what have you. Well, you know, just like, you know, in 2020 when the international students couldn't get to our campuses to, to, to go to university studies, they also couldn't get to, to their high schools to study or to the ESL program. So we had kind of built a lot of infrastructure and effort into this recruitment plan to recruit international students in the U.S. and they just weren't there anymore that they were three years ago. So uh, that that didn't work work like we had planned. Um, so what, what we learned, I suppose, was, you know, you really do have to um, be diverse in your recruitment strategies, uh, be diverse in your recruitment locations, and um, 
yeah, just keep a lot of options open because you know you never know what's going to happen next. I think we've all we've all learned that the past few years. Yeah, it's all it's all pointing back to that theme that's already come up, that adaptability. Well, uh, we'd like to take this time to remind all of you in the audience that we will be having a Q&A at the end of the session. So feel free to include any questions you might have in the chat right now, and we'll make sure to answer them at the end of the session. Darren, wading through information and varying requirements at different schools is often one of the biggest obstacles international students face. Is there one resource or service you think every school should have to help international students? One, sir. <laughs> one service there's so many services um <laughs> and i will say to, sorry to you had mentioned previously unibuddy i just want to give everyone that that may not be familiar with unibuddy they are a peer-to-peer -peer student ambassador company so really having like your current students be able to help advocate and talk to potential new students it's a study in the usa partner as well um so i just want to give a little bit of that background but Darren, please continue with uh... that. That's so many. You know, I think for us, just a really simple service. Again, we talk about what are some free things you can do. Zoom has been a really simple service that we're able to put on our website. We have student ambassadors that are staffed on the Zoom room, our virtual lobby, and they can use that Zoom room to go ahead and talk with our student ambassadors. Students can, agents can, it's free. And it allows students from all over the world to connect with us. We have our Zoom room open at kind of strategic times to accommodate varying time zones. And that also gives flexibility to our student workers as well because they're able to go ahead and do the Zoom room at off hours. So that's a really easy way to talk with, with folks. We use Unibuddy as well. That's a paid service um, that I, that I initially got introduced to through study in the USA actually, which was free at the time as like a free trial and I loved it. And it allows my student ambassadors to kind of text or chat in a way to post blogs, information about kind of our program. So it's just another way to communicate with students that we, we pay for that service. And then another service that we use is called Cranium Cafe, which is for our counselors. That's another resource that our, that our district pays for. And Cranium Cafe is a way for our our you know, education counseling team to communicate with students and to plan for actual um, you know, ed plans. So those are a few different ways that we're able to go ahead and like think about and triage different resources. We have our free resource, our paid resource, and then our district offering resource. And I think that allows students to interact with us in, in a varying type of way. Aaron, are you, are you, are you able to, to, are we gonna do several? <laughs> I know we had asked no, for, but... for, for one, but I, but I don't think any of us are going to be able to just, <laughs> just do, do one. So are there a, a couple of resources or services you think every, every school should have to, to help international students? I, I really uh, couldn't agree with, with Darren Moore on, on kind of what he said in terms of just that, and going back to it again, that accessibility piece is a great resource to have for students. One thing we did, um, a couple years ago that it's really been successful that we're gonna to continue to do is through our CRM, um, enable students to schedule one-on-one -on -one meetings with our admission staff. And that service has been, been invaluable. You know, as many times as sometimes admission counselors, we answer the same questions over and over. We have to remember that, you know, for the students, this is the first time they're going through this process or for their families. And just being able to, to be available to serve as a resource for them, not only even talking about our university, but just about U.S. higher education in general and how to be a proponent of the U.S. education system, I think has been something that that can help international students, even those who don't choose to go somewhere else, which is which a lot of them do. And that's and that's fine, of course, too. Yeah. Georgina, how have you implemented admissions advising into your international admissions strategy? What do your advisors help students with? So we have a bookings, the Microsoft bookings that we use for the students to be able to um, chat with us. And so when they get an admissions email from us, as far as um, their inquiries, then we're already reaching out to them and letting them know that they have the option of chatting with us uh, virtually through bookings 
or Zoom, depending on, on what their needs are. And then we also have a live chat bot that the students can use at any time uh, while they're on our website. And they're able to chat with somebody instantaneously uh, at any time. So those are also options that the students have to talk to our admissions counselors as well. That sounds like it makes it very convenient for, mm -hmm. for students. So studying for and taking an English language proficiency test is one of the biggest investments students make. Darren, how do you think the TOEFL test, particularly TOEFL IBT and TOEFL Essentials tests have made English test taking more accessible? Yeah, you know, I, we talked about this last time when we were just having a conversation. And like I mentioned before, to me, TOEFL and the test is, it's like a pair of Levi jeans. <laughs> it's tried and true. They're classic and they're always going to last. Um, and that to me is like the TOEFL test. It is it's something that I know I can always rely on. It's going to give me an accurate score and accurate reading. Uh, and now that it makes it easier for a student to actually take the test through essentials, rather than maybe sometimes, you know, I would hear all the time, oh, I have to fly to another country to take the TOEFL test because there's no TOEFL test center in my, in my home country, that alone is stressful. Like figuring out how to get to the TOEFL center and figuring out how to get to X, Y, and Z. For some students that could be really hard. And now I, I really love the TOEFL essentials. It just makes it so much more accessible to a lot of the students that are coming to my college, right? For a, lot of, for a lot of my students, I have a lot of students from West Africa that are coming, or I have a lot of students that are coming from Latin America. Um, and so this accessibility piece for the essentials is, is wonderful. Um, as well as the IBT, I have a lot of students that still take the IBT as well. And that is also, again, it's just a tried and true test as compared to some of the other tests out there that I, I, I tend to have some, some problems with sometimes that don't always give a true reading. Yeah. That's a, in addition to the adaptability, accessibility is, is a theme we're hitting on a lot today as well. Aaron, for you, how, how do you think the TOEFL test and, and in particular TOEFL IBT and TOEFL Essentials tests have, have made the English test taking more accessible? Definitely it has made it more accessible. And I think with the, the rollout of Essentials, it's really been a good a good place where our, our ESL faculty, when, when it first came out, they were very comfortable with it um, pretty much immediately. They reviewed it and, and, and gave it the thumbs up really quickly. So it um, has a comfort level with the, the folks that are using and interpreting it for sure. You know, it tests all of the, the components of, of English, you know, listening, reading, writing, and speaking. And importantly, it does have kind of an academic component to it as well versus maybe just um, practical language use that I think our, our folks found a lot of comfort with. But at the same time, there's a lot of convenience for the students too, right? It's, it's priced at, at a, an accessible point. Um, it only takes an hour and a half or so, I think, to, to do it uh, for the students. They find their results in you know, less than a week, I, I believe. So um, a lot of convenience for the students, but at the same time, it provides a result that, that folks here on our campus certainly, certainly trust. Yeah. Georgina, what, what benefits have you found for the, in particular, the TOEFL Essentials test? And this is actually, I think it would be a great time to uh, revisit that video component that I promised we would return to because, you know, I've heard that the video option has been a real game changer. It sure does, because, for example, we have students that perhaps are going into a graduate program specifically that require um, an essay, right, to, to provide more information. But perhaps they're not able to um, put their thoughts into writing it, right? But maybe this five minute speech that they can provide, they can really put their story out there, you know? And so sometimes that, that uh, can make a difference in being able to let them know who they really are, where they're coming from, and why they should be admitted into their program, you know, as opposed to just providing a paper, which is everybody's gonna get, right? Every, it's part of their requirements, a personal statement. 
but I think that video will set them apart in being able to provide their story and where they're coming from. I think that will be a key component to their admission process. Yeah, it sounds like a much more holistic way of getting to know someone. But to your point, not just relying on on paper, you know, on paper mm -hmm. or seeing someone on paper, but you actually get to see someone talk and communicate and present themselves, which is which is huge in in getting to know someone. So, I yes. uh, Darren, how about for you? What what benefits have you found for the TOEFL Essentials in particular? Yeah, again, just in terms of benefits, I love the video component. I think that is um, really a game changer. I, I really think that is such a huge benefit to us. It gets us the chance to kind of hear and see the student, get to know them, which again, is part of that personal touch that I love. In addition to that, again, the accessibility is just what I love about it. Yeah, yep. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear you know, just how, how useful the TOEFL Essentials test is, and especially that video component. And like I said, just helping to, to humanize the admissions application. So it's really powerful to be able to understand the human story behind the application. Aaron, what, what more do you do on campus once international students arrive to help them feel connected to the greater community? You say Aaron on that one. I'm sorry. I did say, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We've got Aaron and Darren, so it's uh, you know, the A and D. Maybe, maybe we can do it that. <laughs> so A, uh, <hey>, you're up. <laughs> got it. So connected, um, you know, our international student services office does does a fantastic job um, with international uh, student. You know, from the moment that they arrive, our new students they. They put on the international orientation program. They work really hard to connect our international students with our with both current international students and with, with our US students, um, not only in teaching them about campus, but also just about the area in general. Um, you know, field trips to down the road to Cincinnati or, or to other locations to really try to integrate students um, into the wider. Um, wider campus and they, and they do a fantastic job of that it's, it's critical work really yeah yeah all right d d darren all right <laughs> talk to us a lot uh, of things how, we do. yeah connecting uh connecting students once they're on campus connecting them to the greater community yeah so a couple of things one um just some easy things that we do uh we have a counseling 48 class that all international students are required to take. And one of the assignments is they have to do like a campus uh, community map. And so we actually have all of the past students, we, we have all those uploaded into what's called, um, it's called Canvas, it's our online teaching system. And so students are able to actually watch these videos from other students that are already here to kind of learn about the campus from the student perspective, which is a really easy free thing to do. Um, we also go ahead and we, Aside from just the general orientation, of course, we do one field trip uh, semester. So we went to the Broad. We have we're going to the Science Center. These are all free. Where, where was the first spot that you mentioned? Oh, the Broad. It's uh. It's Where's the Broad? Year. It's down. What is the Broad? The Broad is a really great museum next to the Walt Disney Concert Hall in downtown LA. And uh, okay. we in Hollywood, we're able to go ahead and just take the metro down there. So we cool. utilize the free transportation that we have. The Broad is free. And then, you know, we, we use funding sources from our foundation office. This is another great way for anyone out there that has no money. We, we use the foundation. Uh, there's a lot of money there and there's a lot of, re they, they love to give us money. So we kind of <laughs> give a budget for the year and we let them know what is we want to do. So those are really easy free things we do. We're doing a Thanksgiving potluck. So we're having students bring food onto campus that we're gonna go ahead and share and we're having some food brought in also. Uh, we do photo contests, those are free to go ahead and like, you know, talk a little bit about the community. So this year we did a photo contest of share your neighborhood with us. And we posted those videos and those photos on our website and then new students coming in can kind of see what's around the LA area. And that can sometimes help them find housing or think about the neighborhood they wanna live in. So we try to, tap into all these free resources that we can. Um, but ultimately food is what brings people to a lot of these events. So if you can get foundation office to pay for some food, you'll get a lot more students coming your way. There you go. 
There you go. Georgina? <laughs> Food is always a great um, hook, right? Yes. <laughs> for anybody in general. Um, well, alongside with a lot of these um, experiences that other universities already do, we do tell the students the importance of how and make them aware how close we are to Mexico. We are literally 10 blocks away from Mexico and you can see it from anywhere on campus. Um, so we wanna make sure that we tell them that of the options that they have and how if they wanted to go across to Mexico, well, what would they need to do, right? Because it's not just for everybody. And to make sure that they go with somebody that knows the area as well, you know, because you wanna make sure that they're still doing it safely, that they can go see the markets, enjoy a day in Ciudad Juarez and still be able to come across walking. It's a walking distance. So we have those options for them as well. So it's important to teach them um, how to get there safely and back. And so I guess with any other even um, local attraction that we have like Carlsbad Caverns nearby, we wanna make sure that they go safely and that they know how to get there and back and things of that nature, you know, making sure yeah. that their safety is um, key component. Yes. yes, thank you, thank you. Well, and we're, we, we're coming up to, uh, we have a couple more questions left in, in terms of our pre-planned questions. So I'd like to take this time to once again, remind you, our audience, to uh, uh, that we will be having a Q&A at the end of the session. So please feel free to include any questions right now that you might have in the chat. Um, put those in there right now, and then we'll make sure to answer them at the end of the session. Darren, I want to start with you on this one. Darren D., uh, with so much of the process having gone digital, what tips would you give for optimizing the digital presence of an institution? Oh, huge. Uh, it, I think it's such a big part of our marketing strategy and getting the word out there in terms of how we communicate with students. Um, we, we pay a, a small fee to a lot of different um, Facebook providers in different countries. And we, we do a lot of Facebook advertising. So uh, I, I actually work with study in the USA. They created a lot of really great kind of gifts. It's like, I always know if it's gifts or gifs, but either way, we have a lot of really cool yeah. gifs and gifs and some like really nice marketing material that, that's for digital. And we, we push that out there um, on all these different Facebook platforms that has been really key. I advertise um, in different magazines as well, uh, digital magazines and print magazines. And then even like fairs, uh, what I do now is I, I have like a little, let's say I have my student ambassador with a picture on it and then a QR code. And the, the, the students can just click the QR code and it will go directly to Unibuddy. Uh, and then they can message the student directly through Unibuddy. And so I don't even really bring a lot of material anymore to these um, fairs. Um, even people who just do the fairs for me I just send them these small little cards and then mm. they're on the table. And then it's been great. I get so many students who are just communicating with my students through these fairs from overseas, through these Unibuddy QR codes that I've created. So that's another way to digitally connect with our students. So yeah, Facebook posts. We also do a lot of Instagram stories as well. We do a lot of Instagram takeovers. That's another thing too. A lot of, I'm sure everyone here works with agents. Mm -hmm. All the agents have some sort of social media. Um, I, I've done takeovers through the agent's Instagram before. Um, I do webinars through my agents. I host dinners or events in home countries that my agents work in. Uh, and I do a webinar there sometimes, a digital webinar. Uh, I also do um, a lot of podcasts. I've done a few podcasts through study in the USA and through some of my other Japanese agents as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, if, if there's any way I can get LACC out there, I do it. So Instagram takeovers, podcasts, Facebook posts, uh, digital marketing that I give to you know folks to promote has just been key. These are and lots of cheap. Yeah, it's lots cheap. of great options. And it's cheap, yeah, cheap. yeah, cheap which, which is a, a theme that I'm sure you're not alone in, in sharing, you know, finding things that are free or inexpensive to uh, further your message. Aaron, what tips would you give for, for optimizing the digital presence uh, that you've implemented at, at Miami U? 
Sure, I think the we've seen the most, like been able to have the most benefit or leverage the most kind of using whatever we can to tell the, sto the student's story. And Darren touched on this too. Um, using kind of students to go out on, on social media or to serve as panelists on uh, webinars or digital open houses that we're doing to really talk about their story and their experience at the university, I think just goes such a long way, much more than, than me telling the students about it. I think also, um, yeah, along those lines, I, I, there's something else about the current students I was going to say. So we have a student ambassador group, and and they engage digitally with with incoming students, and really um, do a lot of work for us. And and the alumni too. That's that was the other one I was going to say. Having alumni do the same the same thing, you know, talking virtually with groups of students from certain areas, from their home home country, or uh, talking just in general, maybe to a group of students who maybe are interested in engineering, talking to a, an international graduate of the engineering college. Uh, just for students to see what's possible, I think is really the what we're really trying to promote with, with a lot of our um, digital advertising. Thank you. Georgina, how, how do you create a more, a, a more personal experience? Even if you aren't able to, to meet students in person, what, what kinds of things have you implemented along those lines? Oh, let me see. It's so many. <laughs> but definitely doing follow-ups, you know, those initial uh, touch points that you have or inquiries that students are putting out there, whether it be through Instagram, Facebook, uh, through our websites, emails. I think it's super important to make sure that there's a follow-up immediately right after that. And there's a hook, especially for international students only because we know that they're gonna have a longer process, right? Even though it might be a short admission process in itself, um, I think it's short, but it might be longer for others, right? Mine is a little bit short, but um, they still have to go through the embassy or through the consulate to get their passports and their visas and, and make arrangements, you know, they have, that is a lengthy process, you know, and one that they need to do well ahead of time. So it's important that, that if you do have a student that has inquired about your institution, hook them up, send your information, be there for that student, you know, to make sure that they do the follow-up and that if you're really interested in, in having more international students, then that follow-up has to be immediate, you know? So making sure that that way they can do things ahead of time and they're not rushing the last minute and then suddenly, uh, depending on their countries, uh, they might need to do things, like I said, ahead of time, and they will not be able to get a, a visa if they start doing things the last minute. So that's why I think we need to take, think about those things as well. Thank you. Erin A., can you share something special about your institution that strongly attracts international students? Any Any special programs or traditions or community focus, anything else. And, and I'm curious along those lines, how do you focus on that and leverage that for your marketing and recruiting efforts? Sure, great question. So I think students who are attracted to, uh, often initially attracted to Miami University are attracted by the campus itself. It's a very traditional US university campus. You know, we have stately red, all the buildings are made out of red brick. Almost all of them are made out of red brick. And there's, you know, mature trees and lawns and it's um, it's in a small college town. There's, you know, 20,000 students here and 10,000 full-time residents. So it's a, 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 a US university experience as you kind of would think about in the movies or something in some ways. And so I think that initially attracts um, students or at least it lets them take another look at, at Miami and then they can learn a little bit more about kind of the things we do well, which is, you know, teaching undergraduate students and, and undergraduate research. But so, um, but yeah, I think a lot of times that entry point is, is just looking at the campus. So what do we do? We, yeah. we use a lot of pictures, <laughs> a lot of pictures, uh, virtual tours, um, op, you know, aerial tours, lots of things for students to get a visual picture of, of what it's like here because international students are really at a disadvantage uh, in terms of, you know, not being able to visit campuses as easily before they decide where they want to go to school, like, like U.S. students um, are. So we, we try to bring that visit to them as best we can virtually. 
For sure. Georgina, how about for you and UTEP? Well, our campus in itself is already Bhutan inspired. So all of our buildings are very um, with the Bhutan architecture. So we're already very international, yes. <laughs> you know, in that sense. Uh, so the students here, our international students, are really intrigued by our binational culture. You know, we are so close to the border to Mexico. And so the University of Texas at El Paso is America's leading Hispanic surveying university with a student body that is 84% Hispanic. So we do enroll more than 24,000 students and 7.1% of those students are international in themselves. So we do have approximately 80 international agreements with institutions throughout the world. So at least 23 of those are from Mexico. And being that we are so close to the border, we do of course attract more of those students, but it, we still have so many students from all over the world that are really interested in coming to our institution. And I and I mentioned this the other day when we spoke. I mean, I had, I had no idea that that UTEP had had that vibrant and large of a, of an Hispanic community, which must just be incredible to be a part of. It sure is. When it comes yeah. to public, like we were just talking about it right now. That's always a big plus. Yes. Yes. And Darren, how about for LACC in the in the in the world of Hollywood, and what what are what are some uh, some things that attract students to international students to LACC, and how are you leveraging those for your marketing yeah. and recruiting efforts? I love this question. I think for for us, it's knowing what your school is and knowing what makes your school unique, and that helps with your marketing strategy. So for us, you know, we're in Hollywood. Everyone knows Hollywood. The Hollywood sign you can see from our campus. And so we leverage that in our marketing strategy when we're just talking about our school, come, come to Hollywood. We also have a lot of famous alumni. So we're able to talk about that when we market uh, Morgan Freeman, Mark Hamill, Alan Arkin. You know, these are big donors to our school as well. And so we have a really great cinema and um, TV program. We have a wonderful music program, uh, theater arts. You know, these are just really great programs that we're able to promote and talk about and push out. And so we do a lot of student profiles um, when we're, you know, talking about our school. It's also urban. So that's the other thing, too. So, you know, any student who's not looking for an urban experience, you know, I tell them directly, you don't want to come to our school. Hmm. We are we are an urban campus. And, and, and so if that's something that you're looking for, then that's us. That's what we have. And even little things too, like transportation, you know, everyone thinks, oh, you need to have a car. We market that too. You don't, you don't need a car when you come to LACC. We have really great public transportation through our metro system, which there's a stop right on our campus. And that helps too. So I think, again, knowing all those things and what makes our school special, knowing what programs we have that makes us unique. Again, community colleges, you know, everyone's always trying to push the two plus two pathway. But I think too, there's a lot of students who want to come for a year to do a certificate program. And they're also coming for a different host of other reasons. So knowing all of that helps us talk about our, our program to potential students or prospective students. Yeah, and I, I, I love that you, know, you emphasize not just what you are, but also knowing what you are not and being able to communicate that to potential students because it doesn't do you or the student any good if they are looking for a suburban experience and then they find out, oh, this is actually an urban experience. That's not what I wanted. So I, I'm glad you brought up that up as well. All uh, right. So to, to, to wrap things up, I want to just go around to each of you um, and, and ask if there are any final pieces of advice you'd like to share with your peers joining us today fellow admissions professionals to help them optimize their international admissions process. Aaron, A, can you start us off with that one? Sure, I, I think um, we really need to do two things. We need to go where, where the students are, if that means talking with them on, on WhatsApp or, or Zoom, that, that's, what, that's what we should do, and that's where their families are. I think the other piece of that is we really need to to make the application process as, as kind of transparent and, and straightforward as possible. I think it can be a little overwhelming and confusing for students if, if we're having them go through a lot of the, the things that maybe our US students go through that just doesn't really relate to, to their experience or to, you know, it doesn't match up with, with, with their experience. So to have a streamlined process to let them, you know, 
apply to the university. Just being able to speak with them where they are, are probably the two things that I, I would recommend. Georgina, how about for you? Um, definitely making the process a little bit smoother and more transparent and being able to uh, put the information out there that it's accessible to the student where they don't have to be like looking through our websites, you know, and seeing where, where can I find this information? I think it's important that like our domestic students are able to look at the information immediately. We should also have that information out to our international students. Um, also to be able to provide any resources available to them also accessible right there to them. You know, sometimes we forget um, to review our websites. Sometimes as an institution, the our websites are um, manned by other people. And so we really need to be able to get our foot in there and being able to be uh, advocates for our students, you know, and also asking those students, were you able to find uh, the information accessible. If you didn't, like, what, where do you think we got, we were wrong, you know what I mean? Let's right. go ahead and fix that. Let's go ahead and update the information, you know, because I think that it's very important to be able to have that information and to be able to correct it immediately. So that way students are not getting the runaround, you know? Mm -hmm. So we want yes. to make sure that they have the most clear information as possible out there. Darren, bring us home. Yeah. Here we go. I think again, some easy things for the application process, over communicate. I don't think you can communicate enough with the student. You know, not only does your application process need to be smooth on your computer, but how does it look on a, on a mobile phone when the student's going through it and are they able to go ahead and complete the application in, in that way? And then if the student has a question or a parent has a question, how are they gonna communicate with you? Well, having Zoom available or having these other platforms for communication. And, and making sure that you train your student ambassadors so they know how the application process works. Because if, if they can't explain it, I guarantee the student applying to your school won't be able to apply. So my student ambassadors are experts when it comes to understanding the application process, when it comes to knowing what language proficiency tests that we offer and how those work, they've usually taken them. They're experts. And so I really emphasize on training my student ambassadors because they're the folks that are doing the recruitment for me. I really put them out there as much as I can. And again, I think too, if you're a shoestring office, you're just a person of one, I get it. It is super difficult to go ahead and think about how am I going to go ahead and, and do all of this that we're talking about today. But I think if you have an easy application process, you, you maybe have some automated emails that go out, which you can do through your Outlook. Uh, you do some Instagram takeovers. Uh, think about the different social media channels that your agents are maybe using and, and tag them, get on them, follow them. That is exposure for you. Uh, and then think about the free platforms you can use for communication. Zoom, super easy, super free. And again, it gives you some flexibility. So I don't yeah. know, I think there's a lot of creativity out there. And there's a lot of things you can do to go ahead and just boost enrollment. And I think what Aaron said too, and I think Aaron really nailed it. You got to fish. Uh, this is a horrible, I don't want to say it like this. You have to go where the students are at, right? Look, look, if the embassies or the consulates are open in Brazil and you have a community around your school from Brazil, you probably want to recruit in Brazil. You probably don't want to go ahead and start recruiting in Turkey because that's the next hot spot. As a community right. college, Turkey isn't a big area for us because a lot of the students, one, that's not a population that comes to our school. And that's just not what they're looking to do. They want to go to a grad school. So I don't, I don't really even advertise in Turkey. I just focus on where the students are coming from. Yeah, it's really about staying in your lane. Uh, and, and as you said, I think all three of you are great examples of this, really being creative, finding a lot of different options to make it possible. Um, and, and really maximizing the resources you have and, and knowing your strengths. So thank you all for, uh, for joining us. Um, at this time, we're gonna go ahead and transition into our Q&A portion of the session. We're gonna get through as many questions as we can. I know we've, we've got about 10 minutes left. Uh, again, I wanna thank Georgina, 
Aaron A, Darren D, for joining us today and the TOEFL team for making sessions like this possible. Make sure to follow at TOEFL USA and at study in the USA on social for even more resources. Let's get right into these questions. I've got one from Dane B. Any advice for trying to recruit for niche schools? Our school focuses purely on psychology. Anybody want to take I'll, that I'll one on? So it's there actually, interesting. we have a dental tech program uh, at our campus and it's a very niche program. So what we did was we worked with the faculty there and the department chair and we created a YouTube video uh, just specifically for that department. And then they actually the faculty and the department chair, when they go out to different conferences or events and they do go overseas, they actually use the video as a recruitment tool to go ahead and promote the program. We also use that recruitment video and we send it to different Education USA counselors that are um, specific to the areas that we see students coming to. So we have a lot of students from France and Kyrgyzstan that do the dental tech program. So we've given a video to the Education USA advisors so they have it on hand. So again, we made a quick video, faculty and the department chair, they promote, they promote, promote, promote. And then we sent that out to Education USA advisors where we see students coming to um coming from to those programs specifically fantastic and this this question comes from valeria r are there any in-person or virtual events you've held to improve engagement with international students parents as well i'm going to give uh, georgina or, or aaron do you want to take a first crack at this well, we do have our open house event, and that one is our orange and blue day. We just had it a couple of weeks ago. And uh, with our international students, we were able to invite the students from Mexico. They came all the way down from all over the, the country in Mexico to be able to come to our events. So that was very beneficial for them um, to be able to experience our, our campus. Um, we also have... Uh, virtual events, evening events uh, that are hosted specifically for parents, because we know, especially in the Hispanic culture, uh, parents are very much involved in uh, the student's education. And so we want to make sure that they understand the process as well to be able to feel comfortable in basically letting, letting their children go off to your campus. So we think it, um, having a really pre a presence with the parents is very important. Thank you. Aaron, this next question, uh, Aaron A, uh, I, how have you made, or, uh, the, the question is directed to Aaron A, uh, the question is, how have you made your international admissions process smoother and more efficient for students over the years? Is there anything you've done that has made a huge impact on that process in terms of efficiency? So there's a couple things we've done just in the past couple of years that I think have made it more efficient. Um, one, and a lot of schools have been ahead of us on this. So we didn't necessarily invent these, but I think they, they're things that we've implemented that I think have been, been positives. Uh, one, we created an application that's a very streamlined kind of scaled down version of, of the common application that we use for all of our US students, just to make the process a little bit quicker and easier for our international students. Probably the second thing we did was to allow students to then um, upload uh, copies of their documents with their, their academic transcripts to their file and not have them go through the process of, you know, sending them by DHL or, you know, official means. You know, we do require official uh, transcripts from students once they decide to enroll, but for the application process, we've allowed them to provide their own transcripts and that's really made, made things easier for them and, and easier for us too. So those are two things we've done pretty recently that have really helped. Excellent. Darren, this next question I'm going to direct to you. This is from Isabella. How do you compensate student ambassadors? Is it on campus employment position or do you handle or maybe I, I, I'm going to add a, a caveat to this. Do you compensate student ambassadors? And if so, how do you how do you do that? It's a mix. Okay. So, yes, I do hire student ambassadors. Uh, I also. We have students who sometimes they are on OPT and they, they aren't able to find a job. So let's say their major is communication. Uh, I will have them volunteer 
because they have to have a job within 90 days. And so the OPT students will volunteer. Again, it has to be related to their field of study, but usually with Unibuddy that, that would work. Um, and so then I have them volunteer. I also have students who just want job experience or work experience. And so that's another piece in exchange for them doing this. I work with the Career Center and we host resume workshops. Um, and so that's another thing. So it's a mixed bag. It's a mixed bag of volunteers. It's a mixed bag of people that I pay. Uh, and I think OPT is one way that you can look at that. Uh, I also should say too, we've had a few um, interns that work in our counseling office that are international and part of their internship, we have them also do um, the Unibuddy student ambassador program as a staff member. Great. Now this final question comes from Corey N and I'm, I'm gonna give it to all of you. So, so first question, does anyone use Slate? And just uh, so just a quick yes or no, Georgina, no? Aaron, yes? We do, yeah. Okay, and Darren, no? Okay, so Aaron, I, I'll give the second part of the question. Have you had any success directly importing TOEFL Essentials results from ETS, including video uh, into Slate? We we haven't done that yet, but I think that we we can. I think it's doable. Um, yeah. we, we just haven't done it yet. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, as we've seen through through our conversation, you guys are busy with a lot of different stuff. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll get there. We will. Maybe we will. Stops, right. Our slate guys are are fantastic. They'll figure it out for sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so thank you again so much to Georgina, to Aaron with an A, Darren with a D for sharing your knowledge today. It's been such a pleasure talking with the three of you. Thank you to our partners at TOEFL for supporting this informative session. And thank you to all of you in our audience who have joined us for this webinar today. We really appreciate it. We hope you've gotten a lot of, of valuable insights and tips and tools to take to your teams at your schools. Have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, and hopefully we've answered all of their questions. Thank you. Thank you so much.